Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm very, very uh, excited because we have a very special guest on the show today. We have Dan, Dan Hendrickson, and he is an author, and he's authored his, his eight books. And he's going to talk today about his love for writing and what he does and his new book that he just recently launched. So before we begin, I just want to give a quick shout out to DMA World Consultant. They are a marketing consultant agency and Mark, the owner, you know, he has a firm belief that, you know, he doesn't believe that people, especially small businesses, should be ripped off by large business companies and the prices they charge. He works with a lot of small to medium sized business businesses and he he tries to help them, you know, get to the point they want in, in life without having to spend a fortune. So check out dmaworld.com. They're on our description. And Mark will be so happy to talk to you and answer any questions you have. Now, to get back to the show, because I'm very excited. As you can see, I'm stumbling on my own words because I can't wait to introduce Dan to you. Dan, why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? Well, hi, over. Hi. Nice to meet you, Stacey. Uh, yeah, my name is Dan Hendrickson. Um, I'm an author. I have eight books out. Um, and I live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, secularly for my uh, putting food on the table. I own a uh, auto detail shop, body shop and dealership up by the Mannheim Auto Auction, which is one of the largest auctions in the world. Well, it is the largest auction in the world. So that's what I do day by day. But um, in fact, my first couple of books were written about some crime that happened up there back in the early 2000s and involving the Russian mafia. So that's how I got my start in writing at, at that point. Um, I have three children. I have a daughter that is 24 and she's just getting ready to go into law school. I have another daughter who is an ABC6 Philadelphia reporter. And I have a son who's a lieutenant in the Coast Guard and he has two children of his own. And uh, I'm married to my wonderful wife for the last 36 years, and, and we're doing great and having a wonderful time living here in Lancaster. Uh, I have a degree in journalism and uh, biblical theology. And I came back to my desire to want to write about seven years ago. And that's when I wrote my first book, The Good Fight. And I've just kept on writing. And I'm a self-published author, and my books have won some awards and gotten some notoriety. I'm still trying to get over that hump of becoming really successful, but you know, that is a work in progress. And just like a lot of other writers in my category, so that's a little bit about me. I feel that, you know, just accomplishing the, the publication of a book is, is an award in itself because it's not very easy to write books. People don't realize how much work goes into it, the thought process, putting it together and making sure you put it together the, the right way, make everything has to flow perfectly. It's a lot of work um, putting together a book and it really takes focus. It takes a lot of wor work ethic and it takes a lot of time to make that book perfect before it actually goes out into publication. Now you've actually published, you're on your eighth book, and now you have a new one that just came out. Can you tell us about some of the books that you've written in the past and then focus and tell us a little about this new book? Because it sounds very exciting when I was reading about it. Well, nice. Well, um, like I was saying earlier, my first book that I wrote was called The Good Fight. And when I was, uh, First starting out in Mannheim, when I first opened up my business, um, I had a nice little shop uh, in this complex that were a bunch of shops. We call them recon shops or detail shops or right. body shops and stuff like that. And the guy that moved in right next door to me was a uh, Russian businessman from New York City. And he was kind of aloof and kept to himself, him and his partner. And they even like cardboarded up their windows and everything so nobody could see inside their shop. But he had started to approach me a couple of times to come and do work for him. And what we did is we'd take some of his cars and clean them. Uh, they would uh, they were based in New York, so they were only in Mannheim like on, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, the sales always on Friday in Mannheim. Well, about six months into these guys being there, uh, we were working. It was like a Monday afternoon, and I think it was two or three big black SUV trucks pulled into our parking lot and they said U.S. government on them. And I can't remember how many, but it was 10 or 15 FBI guys in full camo and a couple even had assault rifles, got out and kicked down this guy's door. Oh, wow. <laughs> and 
you know, we're all standing there. What's going on now? I have a little bit of law enforcement background, so I wasn't that intimidated, but it was kind of, uh, you know, yeah, astonishing anyway. And so right. we sat there, we watched this and uh, the head guy came over and he asked to uh, owned the, the shop that I was in and I raised my hand that's me and he goes well do you know these guys next door and I go well yes I do a little bit of business with them he goes well they're part of a um, a Russian mafia that uh, does uh, uh, drug smuggling and um, money laundering for the mob and they they put it they're putting it in their cars and they're selling it at the auction and it's being shipped all over the country this is like 2002 2003 Right. And um, so he said, How, have you done work for him? And I go, yeah, I have. I've cleaned some of his cars, but I never see anything like that. And he goes, well, he says, this guy said that that makes a lot of sense because he uses other shops around. I didn't know that. Well, years later, when I decided to get into writing, I thought, man, it'd be a great way to uh, write something about Mannheim. So my first book, yeah. which is The Good Fight, this one is just about that. Um, it's a crime-based book about Mannheim, but I, as you can see, I have the Coast Guard involved and a couple other things. And it's about a family who owns a dealership uh, in Mannheim that gets targeted by the Russian mob and they try to take over their business. And their um, the protagonist, which her name is Danielle, she has to fight um, to save her business and her family's life. And so I just took off from there. I, I, that, that was a three-book series um, called The Last Enemy Series. And then I wrote a book called The Legend of Deputy Jim, which um, goes to my uh, hometown, Sheridan, Wyoming. And what yeah. I did with it is I took the dad from the first three books, the owner of the business, right. and I told his backstory. He was a deputy in Sheridan, Wyoming, which was my hometown back right. in the 1970s. And I based that on a whole bunch of uh Stuff that happened back then in the 70s with the biker games, like the Hells Angels and other things yeah. like marauded in the northwestern states and caused a lot of, you know, drug problems and stuff like that. And they're always fighting against law enforcement. So I remember that growing up. So I put that in that book. Uh, the next book I wrote was uh, called The Commander, which was about Jacob Edwards, who was the uh, next to his daughter, Daniel, was the main protagonist in the Last Enemy series. And he's a commander in the Coast Guard. And... Uh, this that's about industrial sabotage on um oil wells out in the um in the Caribbean. And so oh, he wow. had that. and then boy, what was the next one? The next one mm -hmm. after that was Brandy Ballad of a Pirate Princess. This is probably my most popular book here. And this is about a um girl who was raised in the Caribbean by pirates. Yeah. And they were both killed in one day, and she had to take off and go with her uh uncle to get off ship and get away from the english authorities right and she grows up she meets this guy falls in love with him then he gets captured by pirates and she has to go save him wow everybody loves that book and it got yeah. historical fiction of the year back in 2001 next one i wrote was um the living legend this is also the backstory of one of the characters of the last enemy this is an african-american guy who actually trained jacob edwards yeah, and uh, special forces, and he's a uh, he gets involved with having to uh, help a girl who uh, is trying to stop human trafficking in Kenya. Wow! So it gets all all over the place, and that's my seventh book. So and then then we come to Magi Apprentice. Magi Apprentice is just a totally different direction for me, but I've been a minister uh, of the Bible, mm -hmm. a Christian minister for thirty five years, and something that I've been studying. All those years yeah. is uh, Jesus Christ, our promised seed, which is the uh, whole astronomical aspect of why these Eastern Magi were able to um, find the child Jesus in Bethlehem when they did, because they read the stars, which gave the prophetic, you know, um, announcement of the birth right. of Christ. Right. And so I did a lot of research on that, and I've really been working at really heavily the last three years, but I've been working at most of my life yeah and so this is a uh, this is a story it's not it's not a um a textbook or anything it's a story right. about a young parthian officer named rasan who gets uh gets involved with the magi studies with them and and sees these signs and all the different drama he has to go through in oh, that wow. culture yeah so the new book you have what is the title of the new book for everybody it's, it's magi apprentice the one i just Magi. Talked about. yes this mm -hmm. guy, this one right here. 
Okay. That, that just came out like last week. Wow. I love the cover. That's beautiful. Yeah, that is a, that's an original art piece by a very, very good um, artist that lives in Kentucky, um, Carla Phillips. She's an oil painting artist and she's done oh, a lot of- wow done a lot of work for the Kentucky uh, government on um, the state capitol and stuff. And so she's very good at what she does, but that's the original piece. I got the, uh, the, the portrait hanging up in my living room. I love but, it. Yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful work. Wow. So what was your inspiration? What really motivated you to write this piece? Like what, what came to you that really gave you the passion and the motivation to actually want to focus on this piece? Because usually people, especially writers, we get an idea, but then it's, there's something about it that gives us a connection to it and just gives us the motivation to want to, to want to write and to want to educate our audience about it. I think you hit the nail on the head right there. I, I, education. Um, the the book is the the biblical background of the book is based on this book here, mm -hmm. and this is a textbook. Basically, it's called Jesus Christ, Our Promised Seed. is written by a man named Victor Paul Werbel back wow. in the early eighties, and he documents the uh, biblical prophecy and the astronomical signs that took place um, around the birth of Christ. Yeah. And, you know, the Magi, ha there's been a lot of speculation about them over the years. There's a yeah. lot of um, romanticism about them. There's a lot of uh, stuff that people say about them. But, you know, they were really uh, a very interesting set of people. And it all starts with Daniel back in the Old Testament in the court of Nebuchadnezzar when he was made chief of the um, magicians, which is yeah. Magi. And, you know, it's been speculated by many scholars that he taught those people how to read the stars in from a biblical interpretation point of view. And there were a group of them that stayed true to that uh, that training that Daniel did all 600 years from Daniel to Christ, 600 years, stayed true to his training and were able to watch the stars. And when the right signs appeared, they were able to interpret them properly and know that Christ was born. Wow. And I thought, wow, this would be a great story. That would know, be, yeah. Direction. Yeah. And just to show how they did it. And you know, you're talking about two different empires. You're talking about the Parthian Empire at the time of Christ. And then you're yeah. talking about the Roman Empire. And they yeah. weren't friends. They no. fought a lot. Yeah. Uh, Parthian Empire was the second largest empire in the world. The Roman Empire was the largest. And uh, for a group of Eastern Magi to show up to a Roman controlled kingdom like Judea, yeah back at that time especially under a vicious man like herod mm -hmm. it's it's amazing what they would have had to have gone through to get that kind of permission yeah because they couldn't just waltz in there you know yeah. it, it could have been interpreted as an act of war they would have to get all the proconsuls in the area the roman proconsuls to agree to let them in mm -hmm. they'd have to get safe passage from the parthian emperor uh and other kings in the area and stuff and people think there was only three of them no, there wasn't. There was a lot more. Uh, the reason they think it was three is because the gold, frankincense, and myrrh that was given to the child at the at the time that he you know, he showed up, they showed yeah. up. But really, you know, historically, if you look at it, there there must have been a, you know dozens of them, maybe even hundreds of these guys that show up to Jerusalem, and right. got Herod, who didn't want anybody taking his place or threatening his kids, uh, to to uh, have his scholars tell them where this child was born and wow. so a lot of the drama of my story goes uh surrenders around not only seeing and understanding the astronomical signs but getting into jerusalem and how yeah. these guys did it and so wow. i don't want to give away many spoilers and stuff, no but that's don't cool. <laughs> yeah. but they that's did so do it yeah they did they, it's, and it's amazing how they did do it because like some of the points you brought up you know you had totally two different cultures two different countries and you know for them to actually have the courage to go into the roman empire and to mm -hmm. approach them with that that's a that that's that's pretty amazing you know that's a that's a pretty amazing aspect in the story very interesting mm -hmm. you know just by talking about it it really spikes my interest tremendously now, how long well, go, go ahead, ahead. No, no, finish. I was going to say Herod the Great, the way when his his reign started when he um was received an army from Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. to kick the Parthian Empire out of Judea. That's how his reign started. That's how oh, really? he was able to procure, uh, to become king of a client, client kingdom of Rome. So that's yes. how he got his notoriety. And the one who was in charge of Parthia at the time was Phratis IV. Right. And Phratis IV and Herod didn't like each other at all. Wow. But Phratis was also... Um, alive just right up until the wise men went into the um uh, the Judean kingdom now he died just before it happened and his son had to oversee it mm -hmm. um Freddy's the fifth but the, you know all that bad blood that was going on between those guys you know the the Parthian Empire and the Roman Empire it has a lot of history behind yeah. it wow that's amazing that really is amazing how long did it take you to put this book together just curious. Um, well, in one way, you could say I started back in 1984 when I read uh, Jesus Christ, Our Promised Seed. Yeah. But really, the the uh, writing the book took me about two and a half to three years. Yeah. Okay. And there was just a lot of research and rechecking my um, my mm -hmm. time and reading other books and seeing what other people say about the the wise man that kind yeah. of stuff. You know, there's a, there, it was just a lot. And, you know, it, I, having people recheck my t my material and, you know, my editors and stuff going over things. And yes, yeah, it took, took a while. Yeah. <laughs> but it was very enjoyable. Oh, yeah. You know, I think that's what really for a writer, that's what really makes us mo so motivated is the, even though it's a lot of work, it, you're still enjoying mm -hmm. what you do because you have such a passion for it. Yeah. Sometimes you get kind of lost in it. <laughs> yeah you, you do there's get... so much more that i learned that i didn't put in the book but you know right. there's so much you can get in there oh yeah for sure but you also can make that your ninth book <laughs> yeah yeah there you go and mm -hmm. uh you know most publishers and stuff they want they want it they want you to stay under a hundred thousand words mm -hmm. uh, magi apprentice after it was completely edited it started out to be 106,000, got down to ninety six thousand. right and up until then, most of my books were between 70 and 80,000 words. So right. you're talking the difference between a 250 page book as compared to a 350 page book. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, you know, for, I have so many people that, um, that, uh, email me and they ask me the question when they hear people like you speak on our show is that, you know, they're so motivated to want to write a book. They have a story, you know, what are some, you know, advice you could give people who, you know, really want to share their story, have a phenomenal story, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, because they really want, you know, want to educate the audience, you know, on the, through all the, top, through all the knowledge and wisdom they gained over the years, what would be some, um, advice you can give them, you know, for people who want to write a book, but they're not sure if they can and, and so forth. What are some steps or some advice you would give them? Well, everybody has to figure out what gets them started. Um, with me personally, I have to know the ending mm -hmm. before I'll start a book. I can't even get in there. And that, I guess that's the, the start of an outline. Now, I'm not right. necessarily one of the outline guys. I don't have it completely outlined chapter by chapter, but I do know my endings. Yes. And so I know where I want to go. So then I, I can get there. Um, another thing is, is like, enjoy your first draft. Mm -hmm. Just that's your fun. That's, that's for you. Yeah. Um, enjoy your first draft. Don't worry about anything. Just write it and have fun with it. There's plenty of work coming with the second and third draft, with all the editing, with all the correcting. All it's great. Yeah. But just get, start writing. Yeah. And don't stop, you know, don't worry about misspell words or anything like that. You'll catch that later. Just enjoy the first draft. And I think every um, author knows that after a while, your first draft is you telling the story to yourself. Right. And that's, that's the big fun. You know, yeah. after that, there's a lot of work, but enjoy your first draft. That's what I always look forward to, you know, your first draft. That's excellent advice. And I, I find too, you know, it's, it, I also needed to know the end in and I created an outline, but the outline never stays the same. It yeah. changes consistently yeah. as you, as you go along, the more draft, the, the more you go over your first draft and the more you, you start to add things and change things and rearrange things. And it's kind of like a, it's a, a, it's a puzzle that you keep switch, you know, trying to find the right pieces to go together and it takes time. Right. Eventually it seems like the puzzle will be finished, but in the meantime, you just have a bunch of pieces on your desktop and, you know, you're trying to move things around and, and trying to figure out yeah. the uh, unsolved puzzle. 
Yeah, that's true. I mean, I've seen things where, you know, I've, I've, I've switched chapters around, put one chapter that I thought would be really good at one spot and I just yeah. fully put another spot or, um, I don't know, one time I, uh, what book was it? It was the living legend. And my, my editor, Tom Hyman, he wrote me back and he says, you're not really explaining why this guy went into the seal training from where he went into. Right. And he, and he gave me, and he gave me a suggestion of writing a one or two liner. Yeah. And Tom's, Tom's a, a pro and, you know, he's, he was a best selling author back in the nineties, New York times, best selling author. And he's a wow. great editor. But, you know, I started looking, I go, and I go, he's right. I didn't tell it. So I added a whole chapter um, right at the beginning of the book that explained everything. And I sent it to him and I go, what do you think about this? And he goes, oh, this works great. Yeah. You know? And it was just from his suggestion. You're not explaining why he's doing this. And I thought, well, he, you know, the whole thing about show rather than tell. Yeah. So I just showed why he wanted, why he did what he did. I and yeah. But the stuff helps. I've, I've done that in a couple other books where, you know, I get the whole thing done and I go, wow, I need to put something else at the beginning to really explain all this. Right. And it just, you know, but that was fun too. But nothing's for me is as fun as the first draft. It's just, you know, it's just wild. You're just, you're just kind of going crazy. Yeah. You yeah. Just write. You just write. It's, it's, you know, I think it's the knack of being able to be creative, to be able to to let go all those creative resources inside you and just let it, you know, because really it's an art, you know, writing mm -hmm. is an art, you know, you're creating, you, you know, you're, you're putting together the building blocks and when you're done, you know, whoever reads that book is going to receive either enjoyment, they're going to receive knowledge, they're going to receive, you know, and, and it might strike things in a different aspect where people are looking at things a certain way. And you just brought them out of the gray box and mm -hmm. you know, making them, helping them to really see things in a whole different light. And that's what it sounds like when you talk about your book. It sounds like, you know, people who are interested in the topic are going to read that book, but they're going to get, they're going to get shocked because they're, they're going to really realize things or see things in a different way that they didn't really interpret, you know, or think they would interpret it that way and make them actually, it might even make them spark interest to learn more about it you know once they finish your book one thing i love about when i hear other people talk about something that i write is their view of it because it's not always necessarily my view of it yeah but they you know they make that they make the characters their own yeah they're like this you know they get a mind picture of what the character is and what they look like and and that's what they love about the book and it's not necessarily what you know, my mind picture of what the character looked like, but that doesn't matter. Cause if I, if I was able to do that for them to the yeah. point that they could use their own imagination and get into it, that, that, that's, that's very rewarding in and of itself just to right. see you did that for somebody and everybody has their own thing they're looking for when they read a book. So, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's all pretty subjective. Yes. You know, who's reading the book and what their background is and what they, what they get out of it. I don't know somebody once told me, he says, Dan, you just got to find your own audience. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what it is. It's really finding your own audience because not it's not going to be for everybody, but there is going to be right. that one audience that is going to be thrilled with that book right. you know, that have the same interest, you know, and, and I find too, is like when, when I read a book, especially a fiction book, it's like, I ha I'm very visual. So I'm every, I love when a, a book is detailed and descriptive because I'm creating that world inside my head as I read and, you know, and it, and it puts me in such a relaxed state, you know, or it's just a, like a, sometimes an exciting stage where I could be very mellow, but then I start reading the book and it's like all this excitement because the book is just, you know, I'm visualizing what I'm reading and it's putting me in a whole different world, which is a great, I, that's why I love fiction books so much is because mm -hmm. it kind of takes you out of this world for a moment and you're going inside the world of the author, you know, and then like you said, you're creating your own little visualization as you read. Hmm. Yeah, I, that's one of the one of the things I like about writing historical fiction is it gives you a nice framework. Yeah, um, because uh, you know, you it, I had to figure out with well, Magi Apprentice, I had to figure out the political scheme, the, right. the you know the, the the religious scheme, all that kinds of how all those things work back then, and yeah. then you have that framework then you could 
make your imagination work with that framework yeah. but it gives you it gives you help instead of just making something like i don't know if i could ever be a fantasy writer or uh, a real so science fiction writer which is two of my favorite genres to read i read science yeah. fiction fantasy fiction all the time right but i don't know if i could do that because i just you know, be a total world builder. That's just, those guys impress me. Yeah. You know? they, yeah. they can do that. Just, it's pretty wild. Now, where are your books located? Where can people find these books? My books are on Amazon and Kindle and also Barnes and Noble and Nook. Those are the two main sources. A few of them on um, Apple Books and K-Book and then the K-Book. I can't remember the name of them, but there, there's a few on the other ones. I, you know, I published through Ingram Sparks and they kind of shoot them around. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. And I also published through Amazon. Those are my two major sources. And then also, if you want to go to my website, it's danehendrickson.com. Just all lowercase, Dan, then E, then Hendrickson, H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S-O-N.com. Uh, all my books are listed. Um, you can also see any kind of awards that they uh, one, any kind of important reviews that happen with them. Plus, uh, you know, I have a my own little uh, blog page and podcast page. I have some stuff on there. Uh, one of the things that people find out about my background also is I've been a martial arts instructor most of my life. Oh, wow. And uh, so I have a lot of good fight scenes in my book. And um, I interviewed uh, my first martial arts instructor. And I did boxing before I did martial arts. Mm -hmm. Um, and his name is uh, Bill Shaw, and he's a uh, pretty popular uh, Hollywood stunt choreographer and stuntman. Yeah. And uh, he's been involved for with that stuff for like almost 40 years. I interviewed him, and then I interviewed another guy that was one of his students. It was one of my fellow, um, we were students together under Bill Shaw, and his name is yeah. Troy Miller. And he's also a very active stuntman with Hollywood. And wow. we talked about designing fights and fight scenes and stuff like that and how I put it into the writing and how they put it into acting and stuff. And so that wow. was that was fun doing that. Um, so I've gotten a lot of compliments on my fight scenes in my books. Now, Magi Apprentice has a couple of sword fights, but doesn't really go into some of the fights that the other books went into. Right, right. But I do oh. kind of I do kind of uh, make Rasan look pretty good. That's my main character as a sword fighter in that book. You know, so yeah. that's part of his persona. That sounds really great. I love it. I love it. I I like when they do the fight scenes and the action scenes. And I uh, I always like that when I read books and they have action scenes in them. I find it very exciting when when they have that. Now, you have a podcast. Why don't you tell me a little about your podcast? I haven't done a whole lot with it. I've been interviewing people, uh, you know, in and around anything that has to do with my books. I've interviewed uh, those two guys. And then I have a, I, I put a couple other interviews that I've been involved with on there and put mm -hmm. this interview on there if I can. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm just getting started with that. I'm, you know, I, I take on a lot because I'm a full-time uh, business owner. I'm also a minister and thank God I'm an empty nester. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any time for this at all. <laughs> But, you know, then I write books. So, you know, I don't have, I haven't done a lot with it. Uh, it's just something I had to do a little story study with, but I do have it on my website and I, and I, you know, I do have it all set up to do. Oh, so very I'll go there. Good. Yeah. And so I got have... those two on there. Go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Uh, so you I, have... says, I got those two on there and then I got other interviews that I've been involved with. Oh, that sounds very great. Thanks. I would love to see that. And you have a blog also. So tell us a little about your blog and what it consists of. Well, my blog is usually uh, anything to do with my books or the subjects of my books. Uh, one time I just uh, blogged about writing, some of the stuff we've just been talking about. Yeah. Um, I, one time I blogged about cars and uh, I, had, I had this blog called Where Did Lemons Come From? And lemon, you know, you heard the term lemon cars. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, basically, by the end of the blog, I said, they come from you. <laughs> they're your used car that you're trading in that you didn't fix <laughs> something like that you know because everybody always wants to get the most money for their cars and um right. you know just anything because as a writer you know there's the the sky's the limit especially in fiction yeah any, any subject out under the sun is out there I, i've written some stuff about uh, human trafficking which are a lot of my 
first uh, six or seven books are about, you know, human trafficking today, modern day slavery, which is really what human trafficking is. Right. I think human trafficking is just a softer term for yeah. this is slavery. That's what they're doing. Right. They're taking, you know, young girls, young boys, and they're making them slaves. You know? Yeah. Um, so how that still goes on today, even though we kind of deny it because most of the countries have renounced slavery, but in the underworld still goes on all the time. And some of these right. places still have it a lot. So I've written some blogs about that. It's all on my website. You know, just access it anytime. Um, can you tell everybody your website again? So they it's uh Dan E Hendrickson.com. And it's just my name, you know, the whole name. That sounds great because you really you cover a lot of different topics, you know. And are all your books fiction? Yes. Yes, up to this point. I do have a book that I've been writing for about five years that's about um, developing a business like I have. And mm -hmm. I kind of gave up on that when I started writing fiction, but I thought about going back to it. I might publish it someday after I get it all done. Right. Um, so that would be my only nonfiction book. I've written articles and stuff for uh, ministry magazines, you know, uh, biblical studies and stuff like that. I've done that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, most of my, my, the eight books that I have out right now are all fiction. That you know that that last book that you're you you started working on that you you've never completed that actually now and in, in this day and age it would be a perfect time to release something like that because nowadays mm. especially after COVID so many people you know lost their jobs a lot of people tried to start new careers or new businesses and to get someone's input on how you know they did it and how they succeeded is is you know something that would be really resourceful. I'll tell you what, Stacey, I wish I was young again, because uh, if this this is the time to be successful, uh, if a person wants to work in this day and time and put the effort into it, it it's wide open. Yeah, um, I, I just I, I don't hear these people that are complaining. I mean, I, I understand they lost cushy jobs during COVID and, and, and everything changed. But there's so much going on out there in our culture where people got used to not having to work and getting paid for it. Yeah. And some of them still don't want to work and still don't, and, and, and still want to get paid for it. Well, there's, I'm a business owner. I yeah. get somebody who wants to work. I take, I take care of them. I give them everything I can give them. Yeah. Uh, and there's so much more available. You know, if you want to just be a, a good employer, you want to go out and start a business, you're willing to work. The, the sky's the limit right now. Right. It really is. It's just, it's huge. Mm -hmm. And so I tell my kids, I mean, they're just, you know, you give it everything you got right now. You'll get promoted above. Yeah. If you just give them because it's it, 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 it's huge right now. It really is. The market's huge in every category. I um, agree. It's one of the most positive economies as far as like going in and trying to start something that, that I've ever seen. Right. In my right. lifetime. I was born in 1962. And, you know, there were times during my life where it didn't look like you could accomplish much. Right. Um, especially like in the um, late 70s, early 80s. But right now, you know, if you got if you got to get up and go, get up and get up and go, go for it. Right. It's available. I think that's great advice. You know, that that itself is 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 an excellent advice. And I even go back to even writing books. You know, we talked the whole time about writing books, but you know, if you have a, a desire to write a book, then now is the time, just like, you mm -hmm. know, business. If you want to get into business or if you want to succeed in a career, now is the time. If you have the motivation, the, you know, inspiration and the desire, you know, anything is possible, I believe. Yeah. And have a thick skin. Yes. You know, and all authors know that. Have a thick skin. Yes. Don't get bitter. Don't get mad because you got a bad review or, uh, you know, a publishing house or an agent rejects you. I mean, it's all subjective. We've all heard the stories of how many times that woman that wrote Harry Potter sent her book out to everybody and yes. you know, got rejected. I forget, 100 times or so. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, lots of people have been through that. Um, yeah, my editor sent me this uh, link to this thing called "Bad Reviews of the Greatest Books Ever Written." 
Yeah. <laughs> and you can look mm -hmm. it up on, on, on the web, bad reviews of the greatest books ever written. You know, you, you, and you go back and you just, oh my goodness, I can't believe these people actually said this about, you know, the grapes of wrath or something like that. But yeah. they did when it was first released, just really bad reviews. So, you know, everybody exactly. has their opinions. You got to have a thick skin. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And not, and not be bitter and not be, and not take it out and never go public about how mad you are about what somebody said about your book. Yes. And sometimes yeah. constructive criticism can make you stronger because it's, you know, exactly. you know, sometimes people come out and they may say things, but they're not trying to be vicious. They're trying to actually help you. But people sometimes mm -hmm. in our society, they don't, I think everybody, sometimes we all, you know, have trouble taking constructive criticism. Yeah. But if you, if you, if you take it in and you with an open mind and then you actually, you know, analyze it and, and maybe makes, you know, some changes, you could actually really uh, get to the point where you really, it comes out to be a beautiful piece because, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's good to have other people's perspectives because the, the, we are our own worst critics, you know, and, and it's hard yeah. to see things, you know, and sometimes it's, it's, it's great to, you know, have somebody, especially if they're above you or they've been there. And then they give you constructive criticism. I say take it take it with an open mind and 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 use it as a resource and don't take it as a, you know an insult. Well, I'll give you an example. Magi Apprentice. Um, when I was all done with it and when it was completely edited in my mind, I sent it to one of the sources I sent to for um, editorial reviews. And this is like you know they're not they're not cheap either. But uh, I got a review back. And the person who reviewed the book loved it, but she found like almost 30 errors in it, you know, the typographical errors. And so she had, instead of giving it a five star, she gave it a four star. Mm. And I'm like, okay, the book's not published yet. So <laughs> I wrote back and I said, if I fix all these and resubmit it, even pay for the, um, you know, for the resubmission, will, will, will you let her give it another, another glance? And they said, sure. And they even give me half price off the second submission. But right. I fixed all the errors and I sent it back to her and she gave me five stars. And now I'm using that review as a uh, advertisement for the book. Excellent. But but she helped, you know, and I, I pay for editors all the time. And that's another thing about being an author. Don't be cheap about editing. I mean, yes. you can have a PhD in English. I get it. My dad was an English professor. Mm -hmm. You might think you're the greatest at, at catching errors, but another set of eyes. Yeah. Another set of eyes, you know. So I've had I have some really good editors and they still miss 30 errors, you know. Right. And this girl caught them. And like I said, when thank God she caught them and I I, I fixed them and I sent it out. So I'm not sure that all the errors are caught in it. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> but I think most of them are at this right. point. And yeah. so like, you know, I just don't think that people take that serious enough. Get your get your work edited by somebody else. Yes. And, and somebody that's good at what they do. I go through three layers of editing on my books anymore. Right. And that's just, you know, people that that's not me that yeah. edit my books. Yeah. I think that's excellent advice because I think, it, a book really needs to be edited well. And mm -hmm. it's it's good to have different people and different set of eyes, you know, review right. your book and edit in your book. And it, it makes it better because a, a few mistakes, you know, and people catch those mistakes, you know, they, they, they look at your book differently, but, you know, mm -hmm. it's very hard to have sometimes a flawless book, but if you can get mostly, you know, all the, the majority of those errors out of the book, you know, it, 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 it it, it really, you know, can change the, the book just by rephrasing a paragraph can be make the clarity of the paragraph so much better. And right. And people understand it and they get they grasp what you're trying to get across. So it's definitely good to have, you know, one of, the, edit editors. one of the things that motivates me in that category is that uh, my dad always told me that you learn you learn um, English by reading. Yeah. And he said, the more you read, the better at English you get. And I'm thinking, well, OK, you know, if I'm going to write a book in English, then it ought to be grammatically and, and uh, punctuation yeah. and everything correct so that if somebody's reading it, it can actually help them get better at it. A hundred percent. Yeah, it does work. It does work. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's why that's one another motivation to get your book edited properly. So when, you know, because you you want hundreds of people to read it. Right. Yes. So, 
thousands. Might as well help them get better at uh, understanding the English language with your book. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, this has been wonderful, Dan. I, I enjoyed having you on the show so much. And Thank is, you. is there anything that you'd like to tell the audience or anything you can think of that we've discussed that you'd like to emphasize or any tips that you'd like to, you know, uh, talk about before we go? Well, if you're if you're an aspiring author, my my biggest uh, advice is just don't give up. You know, uh, write what you love and love what you write. Yes. And uh, I mean it. Well, write what you love and love what you write. And you know, sometimes it takes a little longer to start loving what you write, but do it. You know, and editing helps. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, nobody ever makes it in this field by just being in, in it for you know the reward of money. You, right. you, you won't make it. it, yeah. it you got to love it more than that. It's got to be. It's got to be above. It's got to be a passion. Yeah. Want to make money? You know, go get a job. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Very but, true. You know, our people. There are people that do well with this and we can all strive for that. But even yes. if, you know, even if like only a few hundred or a few thousand people read your work, that's a few hundred or a few thousand people that read your work. Yeah. You know, that's 100%. rewarding. That you is know? rewarding. Yes. Yeah, it is. I, I think that's great advice. And, you know, I think you too is like when you get good comments or you, people, you know, say, I really got something out of this, you know, that's, yeah. that's a, the feeling of accomplishment. I goes such a long way. It's like, it, it's, you know, I don't even think there's words to describe it, but it get it, it's like, it, it makes you feel it's worth it. And then you feel mm -hmm. so good about yourself because in some way you either made that person happy, you inspired them, you made them look at life differently. And it's a, it's a huge accomplishment for a writer. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's part of the reward yeah. lasts a lot longer than the money ever will. You know, oh, people loving your sure. mother. Yes. One of my, one, one of my, one of my big daydreams is to walk into some place and see two people I don't know talking about one of my books. Yes. <laughs> that would exactly. be such an awesome thing to you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. So, yeah. And you're on a great track. I, I, you know, you, you've been doing wonderful and, and the award you won and the books are fabulous that, you know, I've, I've been, you know, I, I've been reading through all the synopsis and, and they're just phenomenal. I, you know, well, I can't you. really, I can't wait to, to read your latest book. I'm, I'm going to get it, but I, I well, love, I love the fact, you know, that you've put so much time, effort, the passion when you speak about it and the words you won, just show, you know, um, the milestone of, you know, where you were and, and, and how far you've grown, you know, it, it, and that's an accomplishment in itself. Well, thank you, Stacy. I appreciate that. It's great being on with you here. Yeah. Good time. Yeah. I had a wonderful time too. And I, I hope to have you back on the show. And I, you know, this has been a very rewarding, you know, experience and, you know, and once again, your books are on Amazon and they're on Kindle mm -hmm. and they're also on your website, correct? That is correct. All righty. So everybody, you know where to get Dan's books. I say, hurry up and get them while they last because mm -hmm. he's selling like hotcakes. <laughs> All right. All Thank right. You. you have a wonderful day, Dan. You too, Stacey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.